Walking into Sam Gilliam's studio here in Washington, D.C. is an extraordinary experience. You see 40 years of production as an abstract expressionist. Sam is also known as being part of the Color School of Washington. And walking in, I was struck by the creative range of ideas in his art and their fluidity, and yet their very precise execution. But again and again, I'm struck by their great beauty. And in the presence of his work, and this is a personal reaction, you cannot help but hear music, jazz, and you can barely resist the temptation to dance. His work is interactive. Hello, Sam. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to jump in at the deep end. Um, you had said that Washington was your Paris. What, what does that mean to you as a painter and as a person at that time? Washington was my Paris because number one is that I couldn't live in Paris, but it was unnecessary because the history of art in Washington, those who did, those who couldn't, all of those, uh, I got to know. And unlike someone who recalled only those successes, I could recall the marks, the beats, the pores, and all sorts of things. And they were enlivening. And that's real, because I've been to Paris over a period of 20 years, and it's not all Monet. You began with watercolors. Were you working on, on, on stained canvases at that point, or were you doing it with paper? No, it was a way of of uh, finding out what staining was about, although I already knew. Um, it was a way of finding out, it was a way of practicing. Um, it was a way of trying to um, get to an end in order to have a new beginning. And I always, even in college, is that I had a professor who used to think that I should only make watercolors because the, the oil paints were muddy. But I, I, I learned to use the watercolors as a force so that um, I could make certainly many more of those on a large floor than I could paintings. So um, it became a notion and it became a reality. I think that it was reality in the sense that in a lot of painting, it's not the 80 glazes of Titian, but it's the quickness of, of the hand and the immediacy that um, represents itself. So I became a good watercolorist. Then you went on to the bevel-edged paintings. Yeah, there was a need for scale. Um, the first bevel-edged paintings were 20 feet wide or 17 feet, 30 feet. I mean, I knew, I knew the space. I knew the space that had been left in art for a person of my generation. So I wanted to get into that space. So I even had a show of a 30 foot painting in New York. And the dealer cut the lights out during the opening. Why that, was that? You couldn't sell it. <laughs> but it was really, it was really exciting to, to do that. I think that there's sometimes that um, one has to spend time practicing rather than actually exhibiting. Didn't matter. I mean, there are a lot of things to actually think about. He cut the lights out in Washington and I wanted to, in New York, and I wanted to cut his lights out in Washington. But we remain friends. <laughs> and, uh, do, do you, were you naturally drawn to the, to the large scales? I mean, you, your work, to a large scale work, you, you do it, you seem to do it so effortlessly. What, everyone else was. I, I think that there are a lot of 30 foot painters around, and everyone else was working with large scale. And that it was immediate, I mean, uh, it was important for me to do the same. I mean, it was a dynamic. Um, 
you weren't going to sell it anyway. But it was, it was a way of courting uh, an audience. And, and that was good. That was, that was what was good about Washington, is that um, the audience came along with the work. They didn't know who, what, when, so that you had, you had um, the audience for the first time by the work that you did. And was that important for you to interact oh, yes, with your audience? Yes. I think that that's, that's the, most, the most important thing in the world is, as in music, is how well the artist performs and one should never forget it. One should uh, never forget, uh, <laughs> people now want to know how is the artist working for my cause? How, how much is the artist working for my auction? It's better to have something for generations to come for the artist to establish a tradition of how well he works. Like Miles, like Herbie Hancock, I mean, like Wynton Marcellus. It's, it's good to perform more, like Louis Armstrong. It's good to put good work, good sounds in front of or into one's ear and in front of one's eyes. And don't mess around. The drape paintings came next. Mm -hmm. You used light as part of the, of the work. They had been described as very organic with the leather strips that hung them. They, you, you broke the stretcher, the rigidity of the stretcher. I mean, what was that moment when you did well, that? Well, the painters, the, the paintings had to be made very, very well, but they had to be very vernacular. And by that I mean is that uh, the painting existed uh, with the beauty of a William Edmondson and perhaps um, pointing afterwardly, afterwards to, to what I thought that uh, Jackson Pollock might have done. I mean, I mean an, art, an art form doesn't have to be just all superb. It can be, it can be cool and and uh, and immediate too, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to to know what it meant. I wanted to show what it meant to come from the floor, and um, to go into space. This whole inquiry that you were going into included the cowl paintings, the sewn volumes, and the wall volumes. Did they? Was that an interplay? Were you experimenting, wondering how to, how to break the square in that, in that period? Yes, sort of. Uh, it was actually finding forms outside of the, the, um, the uh, square. It was finding what worked. And, uh, uh, you know, um, the history of art is about shapes. The history of art about shapes that are recognized and non-recognized too. Those that are the beautiful natural shapes of, that get into African sculpture, or get into African art, or that get in African um, clothing, are the art that are the shapes that get, I think, into the Latin American shapes. I think I saw a show uh, at the Smithsonian of Latin American dance. You know. Straw and various things, and that. So uh, I I, uh, I got into them. So that I think that someone once told me that that real art is in many museums. So <laughs> I tried to put as many things together as possible. One of our shortcomings here on Earth is to define everything in terms of us as opposed to pushing, you know, outwardly and define everything in terms of everything. And that, so, I, and I have been criticized so much for not uh, being a painter that uh, defined humans. Michelangelo wasn't that much a human painter. 
I mean, he was an architect, <laughs> he was a builder. And that's what art is also about. And this is really great because that at the same time that um, I got to work, there was Robert Smithson's uh, Spiral Jetty, there was so much earthwork, there were the lightning field, uh, Dan Flavin's light, you know, so that art could be about other, other things as much as they were other things to the primitive. There was, there was uh, Barnett Newman. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had a wide, wide field of play and interplay. Were the saw horses, the use of that part of the play and interplay and the ladders as well during when you were working with the drape, draping? My dad was a carpenter and um, there was always something uh, interesting when my mother would ask him to make a prop for the church play. And Dad, Dad wasn't an artist, but he would make the most beautiful ship. Or he would introduce the most beautiful element into the Christmas play. So this was like the ability to go ahead. You know, you do something and uh, you do it a certain way. And that the word is the afterword, is how well it works if you know your your game and what you're doing. And this same ability with your hands, you had once said that uh, if you needed a sawhorse in an installation somewhere or a ladder, you built it. Yeah, and it's also you knew how to. It's sort of bravery. And it's having enough sense is that as you grow up, is to keep your whole life, you know, as a tool, not just the higher part that they call education. Then came the black paintings. After the white paintings. After the white paintings. Yes, I think that the idea was that to, to uh, I knew it was there. And I knew that, I mean, I knew that things were there and things were, could work. The, mostly because of Rembrandt, one of my favorite. And, an artist that we drew upon uh, in college a lot. And that an artist that you work because of an artist like James Weeks uh, from California, the California figure painters, or Nathan Oliveira. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's sort of the synthesis of painting. And I had all these ideas. And the most exciting idea was that of the black painting. I knew that, actually, I, I tried the white painting first because I wanted the painting to be on the wall in such a way that it was not uh, recognized and it, you couldn't see that sucker. So when I tried the black painting, I had it. And uh, I made a lot of them. And, uh, and uh, my reward was to make them. You know, there's something, there's nothing that rewards an artist, I'll say, any more than going into his own studio and seeing that stuff, all of that stuff, have a beer. And, I mean, and, and, and that energy that it takes to, to accept that this is your work, this is where you are, and that you also have to figure out what comes next. You, you said this serious about, about taking yourself, your work, very seriously. Yes. This is an issue you, you keep coming back to. What, what do you mean by that? Could you elaborate on, on that? Art is made and then there's nothing. So you have to invent what is next. You have to have a memory. Uh, to have smarts, you have to be able to outwit someone, and you have to be able to be a, have the ability to change, and you have to have your models throughout history, uh, whether they're artists of color. I mean that um, at U of L is that everybody said our paintings are better because we got so. <laughs> 
but uh, in life, your paintings are better because that you have sort of extension. And that I like that reference that someone said is that uh, I think art is like a salad, you know, you have to make it to taste, you know. And that this sense is that uh, all artists have formula. In uh, St. Petersburg recently they talked about uh, Malevich as being an end, or Rothko as being the beginning, you know. Well, I think that if you can uh, find these synthesis, that is better for culture than it is a lot of other things that are being said. So the idea, I think, that from the very beginning, that I wanted to be a painter, from the time that I bought books that only cost a dollar that says how to paint or how to do razzle-dazzle. They were the experiences that were, were really valid even if they were not about painting but were only about uh, getting up the courage. And I think you have to keep it. You can't uh, turn it on and off. The collage painting, Sam, would they some of that was included in the black paintings, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So you, 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 it was a smooth sort of a segue, there isn't a, a, a break, because your work is talked of as periods, the collage painting is one, one such period, but it's more of a continuum. Well, what is interesting is that um, in college when I was a figure painter, I was very fond of Mondrian. And when I first started to work in Washington, I made geometric paintings, some of which I never showed. But uh, this duality uh, in a lot of art is what moves art, not giving up anything, keeping uh, several things. Uh, Rembrandt is so great, Manet is so great for keeping uh, the tension of the edge by shutting out uh, the depth relationship, women on the balcony, uh, sort of a Spanish painting with black shadows behind. And that uh, painting is, is, is very mythical because an artist does what he has to do. You know, he's like the road runner. I mean, in this sense is that we make, you know, you make things. And that it's, it's good that artists art also has a continuum because there are so many people who are looking and who many, so many people who continue, who make things, even though they are not, literally they are not uh, accepted. I was thinking this morning about the Vasari. Art wasn't written about until 300 years, you know, after it was literally made in Italy, 17th century. Asari started to write about everybody before, you know. And maybe what happens as opposed to worrying so much about a single year, we should worry about our 300 year, you know, recognition. One of the things that happened with the abstract expressionist is that they began to recognize what had happened from the very beginning of time on a plane that had not been done before and that in a sense is that it gives us this very broad history and then way before the cavemen there was the art of, of Africa which no one talks about or the art of Oceania of Africans but in the sense I think that that sometimes art has an invisibility it doesn't make a picture. It has a voice. Sam, your, your prints, um, I've been looking at your print books, and they're absolutely beautiful. I, I keep using that word. I'm overusing it, I'm afraid. Um, but could we talk about prints that you did out of Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. Bill Wiggy is such a nice, down-to-earth guy. Uh, the one thing he tells you the first year that you come, if you don't come back next year, I'm going to come and get you. But, I mean, it's, Bill was also a very good teacher, a very uh, resourceful, and he's very, very open. 
but at the same time as that there was another person, Joe Wilfer, who uh, worked and was director of the Madison Art Center, who worked in handmade paper, and he and Bill sort of collaborated a lot, and you were around them. At least, uh, if you sat between Bill and Joe, they could pass you a bottle of beer from the case. So that uh, it was always a good spirit. And I worked with Bill for 25 years. But I've also worked with Steve Anderson for, uh, oh, maybe 20 years. And I've also worked with Paula Kirkaby. Uh, Out of Palo Alto? In Palo Alto. And that the sense was that uh, Printmaking became the time, became what you did in your time off from working in Washington. And there was always something, um, something new to learn. And there was one fact that remained true. Someone says making prints is like making money. And that's, that's one of the compelling aspects. And it's not only uh, making the prints, though, but it's critiquing yourself, you know, uh, maintaining the energy that can go into prints and then being able to critique it, critique it so that you say, this is what I ought to do, and you would do that. Is, um, but in terms of issues within the printmaking, what were some of your artistic concerns? What were you pushing up against? What were you thinking? Don't think. <laughs> do. <laughs> do it. <laughs> was it the just do it? You, you were experimenting right, I think physically. The, the, the other thing is to, was to... I used to paint that way. Don't think, just paint. Uh, and see where you would want to see how far you can go. But of course there are obvious things to think is that how to involve um, sculptural form into printmaking, um, how to uh, involve concepts of painting into printmaking. And we did boxes, cut and do, did a lot of die cutting. And I think it's the die cutting in, in paper at Bill's that led to the collaging in the black paintings. So... But it was also a part of the huge installation, Fireflies and Ferris Wheels, wasn't it? Was that the enormous new print machine that you used in... Yeah, that was in a way, is that uh, the process for the, for the thousand, thousand foot prints that were painted on that was made for Fireflies, which was an installation for Korea, East Germany, um, Chile, Finland, and, uh, and Finland. Finland, yes. yes. One of the important things about going to work in Wisconsin was going back to nature and getting nature back in me. I mean, I've grown up in cities. And to experience tornadoes, and to see to see the the result of them, and to hear raccoons and all sorts of things that might hound dogs, and you got that in you, you know that feeling. You also had enough sense not to leave the deck because of the snakes, but it. I mean, it's it was. All of these things, you could realize how, how fear, how, <laughs> how night could be tantalizing. It was, it was like, it was like um, something that was the amusement park. All you needed to do was for the lights to go down, for the stars to come out, and there was another kind of cinema altogether. And of course, this is what happened when when one would choose to work at night, is that it just wasn't the same way of opening the door to ideas. It was something that you just... And the best thing, 
was we all stopped drinking. And someone said, you won't be able to make art. <laughs> <laughs> well, how was the thinking different with the night? Well, it certainly is another form of beautiful information. I mean, um, I don't know when it was that I've actually seen the sky as the time that we were coming back from a farmer's picnic and riding in a convertible and looking up at the sky as that you didn't know that there were so many. And um, there was land everywhere, but then the closure of night became so, so much more beautiful. And the loneliness, um, if you slept in the barn, and when the owl got to the birds, and you insisted you weren't going to run up to the house and say, there's an owl in the barn again, and that you spent the night until you went to sleep. I mean, listening to these things. I think mean, it was just beautiful. But then, of course, is that the one secret was that you could read, and uh, it was nice. And each time it stormed, it said, um, Bill had a couple of Cocker Spaniels, and they would come and get in bed with you. I mean, this is, this is, this is too much. <laughs> but I think that it's, it's that kind of experience that you had not had in the city until even last summer. But um, I think the most important thing was to, to be open to really nature again and to be open to those sounds and to, to uh, criticize someone who says that during the 17th century they could open the windows and see all the way to Africa or see all the way to the Holy Land, like hell, not through that old paper. But you, you, knew, you knew the facts <laughs> and that was interesting. With, with Paula, to go back to California for a moment, with Paula Kirkaby, it was a different experience of printmaking mm -hmm. than it was in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. That was a very urban experience, it was... Well, Paula, Paula's house was so interesting because she had never revealed earlier how close she was to San Francis. And the many uh, style of printmaking that you saw with her that uh, San Francis had made, or even when you met San Francis and he would come by to visit you, he would say, it takes a long time to get started, you know. The sense is that there was, there was no, that there was a different appreciation for experimental printmaking, or for experimenting to make prints, or it didn't necessarily mean that the, that the good, the good prints were the last prints, they could have been the best prints, you just had to, you know, open up uh, to this. And of course is that Paula had every sheet of exclusive paper, every kind of e exclusive paper that you wanted to use, every kind of ink, and she would hire any printer that you needed to, to have. And Did you, you have exotic papers, uh, the rice papers, the mulberry papers that you showed me? Everything. I didn't know the difference. I didn't care. <laughs> Do you now? Yes, I do. I, I sometimes. I just, I do, I work quite simply. It's, quite, it's easier. Uh, it's, inevitably, it's not the paper, it's the artist. And that it's that sort of um, attitude that allows you to, to spread. To, to use the whole shop, you know, in working. And that this is something that came from making the Drake paintings that um, were 75 and 150 yards. You worked in terms of the floor. And you had that confidence is that it was the space, that articulation of space, that moving about and through the space, the quantity of, of material that you use that made the work, and that's what, that's what did it. Sam, the slat paintings in the background. Well, the word slat refers to the process that uh, Rickfield made his last lawn chairs. 
they were, uh, it's just, it's uh, the same process that we have here of cutting out a lot of pieces and assemble them. They assemble toys that way too. But um, all of the paintings that we had made in the past had a leftover piece of wood. And it was interesting to put them together, just to bump them and make a, a shape. But it was also time in my life to go back to Mondrian. The work that I make has a jump in it. It may be something that I'd figure that I said a long time ago, one day I'm going to make one of these. And I painted like this for a while in the very beginning of um, coming to Washington. And I painted like that and then I stopped immediately, but now I'm going to paint like that again. Because that, um, there's a, a structural aspect to the color that the color is painted uh, uh, in various hues over each color, sometimes eight. And in the longer series, they're painted and then sometimes a color is left at the edge, as in the, the yellow painting, there's a red. But it's very, very high gloss. Yes, well, it's, very, it's high gloss because of the varnish as most of the paintings have been varnished, but they have not been very high. Well, the color, it makes the colors pop, yep. and they're so luscious, you want to eat them with a little silver and spoon. And it solves a big problem. How that, so? That is to the interaction of the color with the shape, or the interaction of keeping the color uh, on the wall as sculpture. Mm. And so you mean the edges then become very defined and that tension the, the is retained? The edges are very defined and they also they knock your eyes out and they just, you know, they stand alone. And a lot of times in the work is that the, the, the drama of the work is resolved in sculpture. This is resolved in painting. And one thing that happens though is that even though I make the work, I may not see it for about two years because that's when, if all of the things that are in the room or going on in the studio, it's not isolated. So the real, um, idea of the work is meaningful, but if it gets out of the studio for a while and comes back, it's pretty good. So you're working, in, just in terms of your, your working process, you're working on several projects at the same time. Some get quasi-finished, sent out to be completed with whatever... I, I do several shows at the same time so that I have an idea, I have several ideas that this, sh this show two years ago was done here, this was added a little bit later. Then the, the arcs up front were done. And sometimes I, I'll admit to making a big mistake. Uh, uh, I want to go on as opposed to, to staying. But I'm also the kind of artist that um, I know how to handle it when I get back to it. And that, in a sense, is that uh, I didn't want to c continue this painting. I wanted to go into something else. And that... Um, but that doesn't mean the thinking about it wasn't just b in the back of them. I died. I mean, you die all, <laughs> the, way, all the way to rush it back, thinking about this. See, there's, there's an idea of of reading about uh, Malevich to go to Moscow. I was so fascinated by this sort of hanging, you know, which is like uh, their studios where they put small paintings made out of paper and put them there. And that what this means to them and what this means to us, but yet the reference so that um, 
I've, I've done okay now. I know not to open that jam jar. <laughs> Sam, that's a hinged construction behind you. Yes, it's the first. It's the first. How did that, how did that happen? It was, it was sort of transitional. We had a commission to do a work between the back stairways of a custom house building in New Orleans. And there was all this wrought iron <coughs> uh, in both the stairwell, because it was built in 1842. And it was like really one of the hallmarks uh, of the building that they had wrought iron on the inside, wrought iron on the outside. And we wanted to work with the content of the building. And somehow the, the uh, idea of folding plywood like a screen was related to both the drapes and the folded paintings. And in addition, someone suggested that we cut the huge circle out of the center. And we had a choice of letting a view of the building come through. It was really set this way, is that this circle is going to drive Sam crazy for years. And sure enough, it did, because uh, one could, it's a device in, in commission work to, to relate to the public by relating to the space. So this sort of contact between the public and the space was sort of a device. And we ended up putting a cage of, of aluminum elements that ran from top to bottom over the circle. And it gave us this sort of the sculptural reading of, of, of custom house, in addition to the coins um, that are computer prints that are throughout the, the work. Sam, you're about to uh, have a great show, in a retrospective at the Cochrane. It's a museum you know very, very well. You know those galleries like no one. And um, could you talk about what you're thinking about for the Cochrane? Well, the show at the Cochrane um, will start in 2005 in September. And it has to be uh, a brief look at the high points of the last 30 years. Plus, uh, I worked with the Washington Ballet uh, for a performance at the Kennedy Center in several places around the country. And I'm going to ask uh, the director to bring, to compose at least a ballet for some parts of the of the museum. In 1969, the biggest piece was actually a 250 yard piece in the atrium, 250 foot piece in the atrium. And uh, so we hope we can do a, a ballet there. Also, is that we want to do new drapes in addition to the old work. And that would be in the hemicycle, plus um, starting with the early paintings in seconds, restore, uh, snake bite, all those good titles in a room with a drape painting to actually show how things actually started. A lot of these paintings have not been seen. It was the Corcoran in 1969 that Walter Hobbs uh, gave three artists. Uh, Rockley Krebs and Ed McGowan the entire summer to uh, work uh, out our exhibit for the fall. And it was that time that Gene Davis stepped, stuck his head and said, and said, stuck his head into a gallery and said, 
you guys are going into theater. <laughs> well, I think that that was such fun because that's exactly where we all tried to go. Was, was Walter an influence at that time on your work? Did Walter bring a sense of California openness with him? Walter had a way of not saying anything, but yet you knew where he had come from. You knew his connection with um, the, the artists at the Ferris Gallery. You saw exhibits that he had done of Frank Stella. You knew about exhibits he had made with uh, Duchamp or with Keen Holtz or, or um, Larry Bell. You knew about those artists, you know, really big guys. And that the fact that he was in your presence, he just said to me, I don't want any of that uh, color school stuff. <laughs> and this meant, of course, is that I had, I had shown him work by demonstrating by folding a paper toweling and holding it up like this. And he says, well, do it. So I think that he was at that case. What the real influence that he had been was that he sold out the collection at the Washington Gallery of Modern Art in order to raise money to open three studios and to give a grant to pay for the studios for, as long as the money held, to establish a grant of $100,000 for each studio to work on, to help us get Guggenheims and various grants. So we were actually free and that we could experience what it was like to be artists full out by staying in Washington. And um, so that's what happened. I mean, it's, it's a strange thing is that it didn't necessarily kill our tastes for wanting to go other places, but he also organized a series of traveling exhibits at which that we're part of the San Francisco Museum Art for Spaces, the opening of the Walker, and Rockney and I were participated in the Chicago Art Institute um, biennial. And, you know, it, it's a strange thing, you know, that, that um, if you did all that and you were still the same, you could go back, you could ride back to your studio on your bicycle and make art, you know. Particularly because what happened was that you met so many people. Uh, and you saw some people who had their head on straight and some who didn't, but all good. And that it was rather fascinating. And <clears throat> um, I always felt close to Walter because I was the one that he kept up until four o'clock in the morning talking about about someone else's art, or in order that you could give him a ride home. And, um, and Walter wasn't just about dealing with artists, is that he talked to art critics. Um, he did everything. Is he going to in some way be connected with the Corcoran show? Is he, I, yes, I believe he's, he's writing. Yes, he's going to work on the book. Yes. And he may come to town. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. There are a lot of things to actually think about. He cut the lights out in Washington and I wanted to, in New York, and I wanted to cut his lights out in Washington. But we remained friends. <laughs> and, uh, do, do you, were you naturally drawn to the, to the large scales? I mean, you, your work, to a large scale work, you, you do it, you seem to do it so effortlessly. What? Everyone else was. I, I think that there were a lot of 30 foot painters around and everyone else was working with large scale and that it was immediate, I mean, uh, it was important for me to do the same. I mean, it was a dynamic 
um, you weren't going to sell it anyway. But it was, it was a way of courting uh, an audience. And, and that was good. That was, that was what was good about Washington, is that um, the audience was a way of trying to um, get to an end in order to have a new beginning. And I always, even in college, is that <laughs> I had a professor who used to think that I should only make watercolors because the, the oil paints were muddy. But I, I, I learned to use the watercolors as a force so that um, I could make certainly many more of those on a large floor than I could paintings. So um, it became a notion and became a reality. I think that it was reality in the sense that in a lot of painting, it's not the 80 glazes of Titian, but it's the quickness of, of the hand and the immediacy that um, represents itself. So I became a good watercolorist. Walking into Sam Gilliam's studio here in Washington, D.C. is an extraordinary experience. You see 40 years of production as an abstract expressionist. Sam is also known as being part of the Color School of Washington. And walking in, I was struck by the creative range of ideas in his art and their fluidity, and yet their very precise execution. But again and again, I'm struck by their great beauty. And in the presence of his work, and this is a personal reaction, you cannot help but hear music, jazz, and you can barely resist the temptation to dance. His work is interactive. Hello, Sam. Hello. I'm going to jump in at the deep end. Um, you had said that Washington was your Paris. What, what does that mean to you as a painter and as a person at that time? Washington was my Paris because number one is that I couldn't live in Paris, but it was unnecessary because they... Then you went on to the bevel-edged paintings. Yeah, there was a need for scale. Um, the first bevel-edged paintings were 20 feet wide or <laughs> 17 feet, 30 feet. I mean, I knew, I knew the space. I knew the space that had been left in art for a person of my generation. So I wanted to get into that space. So <laughs> I even had a show of a 30-foot painting in New York. And the dealer cut the lights out during the opening. Why that, was that? He couldn't sell it. <laughs> But it was really, it was really exciting to, to do that. I think that there's sometimes that um, one has to spend time practicing rather than actually exhibiting. Didn't matter. I mean, the history of art in Washington, those who did, those who couldn't, all of those, uh, I got to know. And unlike someone who recalled only those successes, I could recall the marks, the beats, the pores, and all sorts of things. And they were enlivening. And that's real, because I've been to Paris over a period of 20 years, and it's not all Monet. You began with watercolors. Were you working on, on, on stained canvases at that point, or were you doing it with paper? No, it was a way of, of uh, finding out what staining was about, although I already knew. Um, it was a way of finding out, it was a way of practicing. Um,